Now, the best place to start when we look at heat input and arc energies is what's actually happening in the arc to make it work. So what we do is we start with the power plant. And this is our welding set. And of course we have the positive and negative sides of the electrical circuit that we can plug into. We have our torch lead extending out from the positive side normally for most processes apart from uh, TIG. Then we have our welding torch. So here we're gonna show a MMA uh, or SMAW welding uh, torch and electrode. As the electricity jumps across that arc and into the workpiece, we'll have a return cable that comes back to complete the circuit. And then zooming in on that, when we look at the arc, we will produce an arc at about 6,000 degrees and this temperature is needed in order to concentrate enough heat in the material to make it melt. You know, if we say, just to give an average, that most steels are melting around 14, 15, 1600 degrees, uh, that large number of heat then just allows us to, to melt and form a weld pool. So, and as that's happening in MMA, we're also producing a shielding gas from the flux, but where we would normally be adding some sort of shielding gas either from the elect electrode itself or from a separately supplied shielding gas. So that's all working and it's, it's producing what we needed to do. It's a weld metal which is protected from the atmosphere. Now when we look at what's actually happening within the arc and how that's going to affect our end mechanical properties, we need to look at the difference between arc energy and heat input. Standards use one or the other and if we confuse the two of them together, then we can we can start to create you know, failures in in brackets there because we we may assume that some welds are not correct and are outside of procedure through mixing these two values up is is what I'm trying to say. So. Um, Let's look at the difference between the two. So looking at arc energy, we can use this equation. So arc energy equals volts times amps times time. And we take that number and divide it by the weld length we've produced times a thousand. There are many different equations. Because this is an equation, you can balance it in quite a few different ways. I like to use this one because we're not having to put anything into millimeters a minute or anything like that. So we can just look at our variables, volts and amps, have our stopwatch to denote the time, and then one measurement of the distance traveled should get us all the information we need. So from that base equation, we can take and add in our, in our values. So I'm gonna say I'm using 20 volts, 180 amps, and we welded our arc time was 43 seconds. I then measure the distance of my weld being 200 mil and I can put them in and what I get is a top and a bottom line. Normally these are quite big numbers so you can see we're in the hundreds of thousands. Um, we divide them by each other and what we get is a arc energy of 0 0.7 kilojoules. Now, that's shown us the amount of energy within the arc itself. But of course, what we're going to see is as that arc is produced, some of the heat is going to leave uh, from the, into the atmosphere through the arc light and, you know, away, away from the material. Some of it will be heating up the electrode itself and going into burning the, the flux in MMA. Uh, and only a, a, a lower amount will actually make it across and in, into the well pool to, to help heat that up. So what we need to do next is look at, well, how much energy is actually making it across into the well pool? 
So that's when we look at heat input. Now the first thing to kind of gauge with this is heat import is generally a European standard term. That's the standards that use this location of heat. But the American standards do refer to arc energy as heat import. So it can be a little bit of a, a confusing uh, cover. So if we're looking at heat input here, it's still the same equation. So I can still use my 20 uh, volts times 180 amps by 43 seconds. We've traveled for 200 millimeters uh, and so on. But what we're going to do is when we calculate that all out, that number of kilojoules we had before, we're going to times that by what we call a thermal efficiency. Now, every process has its own thermal efficiency, uh, and we've got to know that. So, so taking our equation here, 0 0.774 kilojoules times our thermal efficiency, we can look at those and say right, different welding processes have different efficiencies. So submerged arc is 1, and TIG is 0 0.6, so they're dropping down here. Now, this is a, a measure of how much heat actually makes it across the arc into the well pool. So submerged arc is a covered process where the arc is not open to the atmosphere. So all of that heat is forced down, or we assume all of the heat is forced down into the well pool. And then different processes do or have different efficiencies of that. So you can see the numbers dropping down with TIG in the arc welding processes being one of the worst performing for efficiency. So we've been looking at MMA welds up to now. So let's take our MMA value of 0 0.8 and put that into the equation. So now we get 0 0.774 times 0 0.8. And then we get a heat input value of 0 0.6 kilojoules. So going back to what we said at the start of this video, you can see why if one person is working with arc energy numbers and one person is working with heat inputs, you can get very different numbers. You know, with TIG welding, it can be 40% different. And that's going to raise some questions during manufacturing control as we um, try to take va values and then apply them to things like WPSs and PQRs and welder calls. And you'll see that they're working outside of procedure when really they're not. We just haven't accounted for the correct variable. 